Hey, Miss Bay. Hi, how are you? I'm um, well.
so we want to come together, all of the wheel will come out tonight at 6 o'clock, and we're going to have a, a short uh, couple, probably songs of praise, and then we'll just have time for you to pray if you like to, if you don't, you don't have to, but we just want to agree together to pray for God's will to be done, and so we want to encourage everybody to come out and uh, have a time of prayer together tonight as a church family at 6 o'clock. Also, some other things coming up that you need to be aware of. On Saturday, November the, what was it, the 14th, I believe, David is having for the youth their drive-in movie night. And that's at 5 o'clock, and that's their, what's it called, box? What's it called? Uh, drive-in. Drive-in, box, yeah, whatever. You, if you got kids, you know, put them in a box, bring them out here, watch a movie. Work out has a pop going, they don't care, give them a little candy while well, there's a mate. So just bring them on. Also on the 15th, uh, that we are having our Christmas parade and bath again this year. And we like to put a float in because it's an opportunity to have a little witness for the community. So David is going to have a Christmas float uh, meeting on at 4.30 on Sunday the 15th. And he's going to do a little ice cream float to entice you to come out and work on the float. Hope you catch the connection there. And I know that you're a lot of you are very artistic and talented in those areas, so please come out and support and help David, because Chris and the elders put it all on him. So, right? Amen. 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 There you go. He volunteered, my recollection. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's he right. was voluntold, right? Yeah, he was voluntold, that's right. So, also we got our annual Thanksgiving meals coming up, and John Scott wants to say something about that.
sense of pride, especially about oneself. Self-centered boasting about intellect, wealth, past accomplishments, personal achievements. It's easy to attach these things to one's self-worth on these earthbound things. On what basis are such boasts short-sighted and foolish? How about this? I was created to glorify God, but see how smart I am. <laughs> I have willfully rebelled against the king of kings, but see my great wealth. Or I like this one. I am guilty of treason and justly deserve death. But let me tell you about all my personal achievements. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The life changing good news is this that Jesus died so that we might have something truly substantial in which to boast. In the language of Paul from Galatians 6.14, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. And to the minds of those that are still firmly fixed on the things of this world, this encouragement is foolishness. But to those whose minds are set on things above, this is a solid rock in which to build our eternal hopes. When I die to the world, I can finally live for God. When the fleeting world has been crucified to me, I have freedom to live for the eternal one who matters most. Jesus died that we may live. This bread represents his body, beaten and torn, nailed to the cross. This juice represents his blood that was shed for our sins.
dive into your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us. Help us to hear your voice. Lord, I ask that you help me get out of the way so that you can talk to your people. Lord, if there's something that we need to change, if there's something that we need to do, then we pray that you would speak to us through your word today. We pray in Christ's name. Everybody say I heard about the representative of a gas company who called the church secretary and said, we need to send a service man out to uh, light the gas pilots and adjust the furnace, make sure your system's ready to go for the season. And the secretary said, well, I better meet the workman when he comes or he will never get the furnace going. Well, the gas company rep insisted that this person is, is well trained and they'll have no trouble getting all that stuff working, that they do it for, for a living, they're, they're professionals. And the church secretary said, you don't understand. When your man tries to adjust the furnace, he'll go out of his mind. The thermostat in front of the sanctuary is not hooked up. We leave it up there for the people who constantly want to change the temperature in the sanctuary. <laughs> the real thermostat is hidden and only I know where it is. <laughs> now, how many of us would like to have a, a vacant thermostat in our house? <laughs> but the, 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 uh, the secretary knew where the real thermostat was. Warren Wearsby said, when God permits his children to go through the furnace... He keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. That's another way of saying that even when you go through the fires of this life, you are not out of his hand. He is still on the throne. He still has you. Our, our sermon text this morning is one of the best known stories from the Bible. If you'll turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. It's the story of three friends who find themselves getting thrown into a fiery furnace. Now how do they get there? The, the, the very same situation the devil used to tempt them and try to destroy those guys, God used to test and grow their faith. And if, if your faith can't be tested, then your faith can't be trusted. As we look at the faith of these three friends, it will help us examine our own faith and see where we stand with God. So as the story opens in Daniel chapter 3, we see that a devoted faith stands when others bow. Daniel 2 ends with the interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And you remember he saw a statue in a dream and the, the head of the statue was made of what? Nobody was paying attention. Gold, right? And, and the head of the statue was made of gold and it was a representation in the dream that God gave his vision. It was representing who? King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And so now, we don't know how long it's been since he had that dream that it was interpreted, but now the king is building this huge idol, this statue. Daniel is serving in Babylon in the capital of the king's court, but, but the others, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are promoted to leadership out in the kingdom. And as we pick up in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue has now become... A reality. It may have been months, it may have been 20 years later, we're not sure, but this is what happened in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and it's with 6 cubits. It, it's huge. It's, it's very tall and very slender, okay? But it, it's just very, 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 very tall. It's, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the councilors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king set up. Then the, all these people, I'm not going to run through the list of all they were, they came and they stood before the image Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the commandments given, O peoples, nations, men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigeon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, when the concert starts, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. So the music starts, and what does everybody do? When the music starts, everybody bows down. 
But some of the Chaldeans who are on their knees worshiping their king's idol look over and they see these three Jewish young men who aren't bowing down. And so they run to the king and report, trying to get him in trouble. It kind of reminds me of, you know, I picture people trying to report you to the governor for not wearing a mask in Walmart, right? It's kind of the image that I got. But in, in verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Now they, these three friends, heard the command of the king. It was clear, bow and worship or die. And when the music starts and everybody bows, they stand. Even though everybody else bows, they stand. When you are tempted to compromise for comfort, don't be afraid to stand. What is this statue? It's an idol to man's pride. The head of gold becomes a statue of gold. Nebuchadnezzar's accomplishments, his riches, his wealth, his control of everybody else. I can make you do what I want you to do. I can make you worship who and what I want you to worship. And if you want to live in my kingdom, then you're going to obey me. You're going to go with the flow. You're going to worship my idols, join my religion. You're going to do the same thing everybody else is doing. Where was the statue built? Babylon? There was something else that happened in that same region many, many, many years earlier. I believe it's recorded in Genesis 11. There was this tower, tower that was built, the Tower of Babylon. And what was that tower? It was mankind joined together in unity, lifting up a tower to, to really show off the greatness of something so tall, we can reach to the heavens where God is. God destroyed that tower, didn't he? And spread people out over the globe. But in the same place, Nebuchadnezzar builds this golden idol high into the sky to, to idolize his own power, man's achievement. And if you don't conform, if you don't do what I say, you're going to be thrown in the fire. What would you have done in that situation? It would have been so easy for those guys to find an excuse to bow, wouldn't it? Isn't that what we do? We look for excuses to bow down, to compromise. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is doing it. Why shouldn't I? I will bow down. I'll bow down on the outside, but I won't bow down in my heart. Because you can't make me bow down in my heart. But on the outside, sure. Just to show. It doesn't really matter. What does it matter if I bow down? I'm not really worshiping. Nobody back home will know what I did out here. It said that really matter because what happens in Vegas, what happens in Greenville, what happens in Raleigh, right? I can do a whole lot more good for my people if I'm in the king's court than if I'm ashes in the furnace. So God would want me to bow down now so that I can help his people. We, we, we want to rationalize. We've got to hear these guys rationalizing why they should bow. But true faith doesn't look for loopholes, does it? You obey God when he speaks. It was enough for these guys to know the first two commandments of the Bible, uh, of, of, the, of the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? No other God before me. No other God before me. And the second commandment? You shall not create an idol. You don't bow down. You don't worship anything and anybody other than me, the Lord your God. And that was enough for these three friends to know that they could not compromise their faith for comfort. They couldn't excuse this idea of bowing down. Now that same type of temptation is with us today, to bow down. We are tempted to compromise for the sake of comfort. I think of a very smart young lady in our church family who is furthering her education and her career in, in the field of science. And, and as she goes on in the course of her career, there are going to be professors and colleagues and employers at the university level who are going to expect her to compromise her beliefs in God and his creation of this universe if she wants to be taken seriously and if she wants promotion, if she wants a position. She's going to have to take a stand. And it's not always going to be 
Because the temptation is to be quiet and go with the program just like everybody else. And then I can do good later for God. I think of the grandparents who desperately want to spend time with their grandchildren, but they know if they say anything about the sinful lifestyle of their child, then they're not going to be able to see their grandkids. And there's a temptation to compromise. I just won't say anything because I want to see my grandkids. If you listen to big media, listen to Hollywood, listen to academia, you see a politically correct view on marriage and sexuality and climate change and fossil fuels and abortion and race relations and politics. And if you don't agree with the position of the elites in all of these spheres of, of influence, then you are going to be thrown into the fire. Your social media accounts will be taken down. Ooh, that's a nightmare. <laughs> it actually is kind of tough. You lose some influence. You lose relationships. If you don't agree with their positions, you could lose your job. If you don't agree with their positions, if you say the wrong things, wrong, you could lose relationships. You could lose your business. You could lose your freedom or even your life, the way things seem to be headed. And I know some of you thinking right now, preacher, it's not going to happen here. That's an exaggeration, right? We can never get to a place in America where you could lose your freedom or your life just because you believe in Jesus and you stand up for Jesus. That will never happen. You tell that to my brothers and sisters in China. You tell it to them. In 2018, the Chinese Communist government admitted that there were 44 million Christians in China. The actual number is higher than that, probably closer to 60 million. And as the word of God has flourished, more and more people coming to Christ in that country, the government has begun to crack down more and more on the church. And they're trying to actually, instead of eradicate it, gain control of the church and, and influence what they do and what they say and what they believe. The ones that they allow to stay open. I read an article from last year that talked about the early reign covenant church. The Communist Party closed that church, removed the cross from the place they were meeting. They arrested the preacher and his wife and over a hundred church members. The preacher's name was Wang Yi and his wife are charged with inciting subversion, which carries, uh, it could carry 15 years in prison. See, the government's trying to gain control of the church, forcing the churches that stay open. If you want to stay open in Communist China as a church, they're going to put cameras in your church building so that they know who's going and who's coming and who's saying what, and they're going to listen in. And they're actually changing translations of the Bible to say what the state thinks the Bible should say. They're trying to gain control. Now that's happening to our brothers and sisters in China, and you're like, well, that could never happen here. But I get nervous when I hear members of one of the two major political parties in our country declaring themselves to be democratic, socialist, or communist. And I'm concerned when I read statements in news articles like this one from 2019. More than a third of millennials in the U.S. now approve of communism, while the popularity of capitalism has plummeted since 2018, according to YouGov poll. And I saw numbers like that in more than one source. It might be big government trying to make us bow down to an idol. It might be a boyfriend who is tempting you to compromise your faith for the sake of your relationship. Wherever you feel tempted to compromise for the sake of comfort, don't do it. Don't be afraid to stand for God. How do you stand today? How do you take a stand for God today? You stand respectfully but firmly for God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't blow a trumpet and call attention to themselves. They didn't make a lot of noise. They weren't looking for a fight. They didn't run from it either. They, they were told, you bow down to this idol or you're dead. And they simply... They stood because they had a thus saying the Lord. How might we take a respectful but firm stand today? It could be as simple as saying no to temptation. Remember the D.A.R.E. program and when some of us were young people, D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs, and then others would just say no. no. You know, 
you should you could be told, hey, you've got to do this. You know that's not what God wants you to do. And you just say, no, that's a wonderful thing. Right? Say no to the devil. Say no to the temptations. It might be just not taking part, not going to the party where you know all of your co-workers are going to the party and they're going to be drinking and doing all kinds of crazy town stuff. And, and you just take a stand for Jesus by saying, not going. And you don't make a scene, you don't make a big to-do about it, well, I'm holier than you, and I'm not going to the pub. You just don't go. Right? This week, you and I have the opportunity and the responsibility <laughs> of taking a quiet stand and a firm stand by voting. Be careful, preacher. You're better. Don't talk about politics now. Some of you are thinking that. Some of you are like, go for it, go for it. <laughs> I'm going to do what I believe Jesus wants me to do. That's all I can do. I read in Romans 13, verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God of those which exist or are established by God. I read that in Scripture, so I know it's true. And I believe our founding fathers recognized the Constitution and wrote the Constitution to be the governing authority of this country. You and I are to subject ourselves to that authority by taking part in the election process. I've never understood why somebody will say, well, I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't matter. You have a responsibility to vote. It's foolishness not to vote. Because you're going to have a say or you're going to let somebody else have a say and those who are leading us. Now, there are two major issues I want to talk about briefly on which we have a thus saith the Lord. It's not my opinion. It's not the church's opinion. And your opinion and my opinion don't matter a hell of it. What matters is what God says about it, okay? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what Republicans or the Democrats say about it or the Libertarians or anybody else. That is what God says. Just like those three men stood because they had a clear thus saith the Lord, we should stand because we have a clear Thus saith the Lord. And as we consider who we're voting for, from the highest offices in the land to the lowest office in the land, there are, in nearly every case, only two options. You're going to either have a Republican or a Democrat. Do you agree with that? It's the reality we live in. Should we have a third-party system, a three-party system? I think that would be the best thing, but we don't. We have two parties. But we have to consider where those parties stand and the people in those parties on the things that are clear in Scripture. And so I, I want to just look at two things. First of all, our God is pro-marriage. There's no debate. If you disagree with that, you don't disagree with me, you disagree with Jesus. He is pro-marriage. He designed marriage to be a relationship between who? Man. One man and one woman. That's a thus say the Lord. That's what he did. Now let me read from the Republican Party platform. Not endorsing them. I don't agree with all of them, but let me read their party platform. Our laws and our government's regulations should recognize marriage as the union of one man and one woman and actively promote married family life as the basis of a stable, prosperous society. That's where that party stands. Does every Republican agree with that? No. But that's the party platform. The Democrat Party platform well, they want to redefine marriage. Quote, Democrats applaud last year's decision by the Supreme Court that recognized that LGBT people, like other Americans, have the right to marry the person they love. I see a thus say the Lord issue. And I'm supposed to stand up and not bow down to the pressures of this world to compromise on the issue of marriage. <coughs> The second issue I want to bring up is that our God is pro-life. Our God is pro-life. Why is He pro-life? Because He knits us together in our mother's womb. Because He breathes the breath of life into us. Because we're His creation. Because He tells us He has plans for us from before the beginning of time. He knew who we were even before we were knit together in our mother's womb. He has plans for us. Our God is pro-life. The Republican Party platform, quote, we're proud 
right to stand up for the rights of the unborn and believe that all Americans have an unalienable right to life as stated in the Declaration of Independence. We affirm the dignity of women by protecting the sanctity of human life. Does every Republican believe that? No. But that's the party platform. The Democrat Party says this, that they strongly and unequivocally support Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to make decisions regarding her pregnancy, including a safe and legal abortion. That's their position. And I believe this is an unsavable issue. Stand up. Everybody else is going to bow down to political pressure on what's politically correct and what feels one way or the other. Stand on what God says in His Word. We're fearfully and wonderfully made by Him. Stand up. the bottom of the ticket to the bottom of the ticket, stand up. Evaluate who believes what and take a stand where God stands. There are a lot of people who are bowing down to false God. You stand for God. Stand quiet. Stand respectful. But stand firm. Now I'm going to step off each other just a little bit and we're going to move on in the story. And we see as we go back to Daniel, Sh uh, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that a determined faith trusts when others tremble. These three friends are called out. They stood for God. Now the test is going to get even harder. And when the pressure comes, everybody has fear. Everybody has fear. When you see the fire coming your way, you have fear. The, the thing is, you've got to fear the right one. you got to fear the right one. Look at verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Is it true? that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I set up. Now, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, all those instruments, if you'll fall down and you'll worship the image I have made very well. But if you don't worship, you're going to immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And here's the question. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Wow. They're singled out. They're given a second chance. The pressure is building. No doubt what will happen to them if they don't bow down. If they, if, they, if they stand up for God, they know what's coming. And here's their answer. These are the only words we get from them in this whole story. In verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If we're guilty. We don't need an answer. But we're guilty. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the gold image you set up. So the king says, what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? And the answer is, our God can Matthew 10, verse 28. Jesus said this. He said, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows the soul for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I know some of us have fewer hairs to count than others. But God has numbered every hair on your head. He knows them, okay? And when these guys come out of the furnace at the end of the story, guess what? Their hairs are not even singed. When you are threatened and tempted to compromise for comfort, you need to ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen to you? What can they do to you? They can fire you. They can take your property away. They can throw you in jail. They can kill you. Yeah, they might can but then what? We'll be with Jesus. We are tempted to compromise because we fear a lot of things. We fear being unpopular. We fear losing that boyfriend or that girlfriend. We fear uh, losing a friend at work. We fear not having what everybody else has. We fear getting fined or going to jail. We fear getting killed. Would you rather be punished in this life on earth and 
be with God forever or be comfortable and safe and go with the flow on earth and be separated from God and healed forever. you got to think about that. Fear the right one. And obey even when it might not be comfortable. What did they say? They said, we're not going to bow down to your idol. Our God can save us. He can rescue us from you. But even if he does not, we are not going to worship your gods. We're not going to bow down. Now, folks, we know what the story is, don't we? And that, that, that actually takes away from the enjoyment of this story a little bit, the tenseness of it. Because we know what's going to happen, almost all of us do. But these guys didn't. They had no idea when they're standing there before the king what God was going to do. Was he going to let them be carried up and thrown into the fire and burned to death and die? Was he going to stop them from being tied up? Was he going to stop them from being carried off? We don't know. They had no idea. You don't know whether God's going to save you from the pain and the loss of the fire or if he's not going to let you get hurt at all, or whether he's going to allow you to suffer in those flames for a season. You know, a lot of times we want to make a deal with God. God, I'll obey you as long as you heal me. As long as you heal my spouse. God, I'll obey you as long as you save my marriage. I'll obey you, God, as long as you, you let me keep my good job. I'll obey you. I'll serve you as long as you give me plenty of money and security and comfort. I'll serve you. Real faith doesn't try to make a deal with God, does it? Real faith says, God, I will obey you even if my loved one dies. I will obey you even if no healing comes in this life. Even if I lose my job or the relationship or my child, I will obey you even if I get thrown into the fire and it hurts more than I can bear. I'll obey you. But when you have that kind of faith, a dedicated faith, Jesus is right there with you. A dedicated faith is delivered through the fire. When you stand for Jesus, you're going to be thrown into the fire at some point. In, in verse 19, look what he says. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. His facial expression was altered toward these guys. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. So they're blowing the bellows even harder, getting more air in there so that the flames are just getting so intense. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. These men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their outer clothes, and their other clothes were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace had been made extremely hot. The flames of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Can you imagine the way they felt as they're tied up and they're picked up and they're carried toward the furnace? I can just picture this conversation going on in their brain. All right, Lord, any moment now, okay, we're being tied up. All right, Lord, any moment, you can just show up and, and kill our enemies and show them how great you are, okay, and now we're being picked up, we're being carried. Oh, this is good, God, now you're going to stop all these guys and, and everybody's going to see how great you are. And we're getting mighty close, and the guys around us are starting to sweat. And Lord, any moment now. <laughs> and I can hear them screaming as they're being thrown. Really, I can. Because even when you have faith and you're standing for God, are you still scared? Yeah, yeah there's just something natural there. The flames, you know they're going to burn you up. But they don't. They don't. See, God didn't stop them from being bound and carried. He didn't stop them from being thrown into the fire. And I'm reminded of Abraham up on the top of the mountain with his son Isaac, his loved son underneath him. And he's got the knife raised about to kill his son because God said, sacrifice your son for me, your only son whom you love. And so he raises his knife and just before the killing stroke, when it's getting ready to come down, what does God do? He says, hold up. <laughs> hold up. You've shown me your faith. That's what's going on. It's a trial by fire, an opportunity for them to grow in their faith. So even as they're carried up, even as they're being thrown in, they're still not doing what? Bowing. Bowing. They're not bowing down. They're not compromising. And in the fire, they get closer to Jesus than anywhere else. Look at verse 24. 
Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loose and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now there are a lot of people who say that that fourth man in the fire was an angel who God sent to, to rescue him, but there's a whole lot of us who don't believe that. See, I think that's Jesus. I believe Jesus stepped down off of his throne and came down into that fire with even those fellas. The ropes that bound them are burned up and they're walking around with Jesus in the flames. This is a moment that they and anybody else would fear above everything else that you could imagine. Being thrown into a furnace to burn to death. And yet Jesus is right there in the fire with them. And they're in burn. And I've heard Folks, when you go through the fire in your life, that is the time when Jesus draws closer to you than any other. Look at verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. It's a miracle, right? You believe it happened? Yes. I do. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him. He can't, he doesn't understand that that would be Jesus. He just assumes it's some kind of messenger from, from their God. He says, put their trust in him, violated the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation or tongue, that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then he calls them to prosper. The king calls them to prosper in the province of Babylon. Their punishment led to a promotion. Jesus walked with them through the fire and he brought them out the other side. Now as we come to the end of this message, there are four lessons I believe we should apply in our own lives today. The first one I see is that there is a time to disobey the law. In general, Christians are to, sub to submit to the governing authorities. As 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, we should pray for our leaders so that we can live tranquil and quiet lives. And just like the, these three friends weren't looking for a fight, we shouldn't be looking for one. We shouldn't run from either of them. But, but, but uh, if our leaders try to force us to disobey God, then we have to do what? Stand. We have to stand. Because we've got to glorify God. Obey God, not man. That's what Peter and the apostles said to the religious leaders in Jerusalem when that governing authority said, You quit preaching about the name of Jesus. What did they say? We're going to obey God rather than man. The, the second lesson is don't compromise your faith. Don't give in to peer pressure just because it looks like everybody else is bowing down. I heard the story from several years ago about a major university that was working with uh, the television show Candy Camera. Y'all remember that show Candy Camera? They were conducting a psychological experiment on the power of peer pressure. They put actors in a waiting room in a doctor's office and all of the actors were just wearing underwear. They were sitting there reading the paper whatever might be wearing underwear. And the unsuspecting actual patients who, who came in and signed in the law book, they looked around and saw everybody wearing the underwear because the doctor's just going to tell you when you go in there to do what? <laughs> Disrobe, right? That's the proper term for it, right? Get, get uh, down to your skivvies, I guess. Well, anyway, uh, they see everybody already in their underwear, so what do you think they do? <laughs> they get down to their underwear and sit down. Peer pressure. There was another one they did where uh, they had an elevator, a, a big elevator, and everybody, the actors that were in the elevator, they were turned around with their back to the door. And so when people got onto the elevator and they pushed a button and they looked and saw that everybody was facing the back of the elevator, what did they do? They 
against the back of the elevator. Peer pressure. The power of peer pressure. You may think you're the only one taking a stand for Jesus. Guess what? You're not. There are other brothers and sisters around you who are trying to stand for Jesus too. And maybe what they need to see is that they're not the only ones. Don't you think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got strength from not only the Lord, but from each other. So don't give in to peer pressure. Don't compromise your faith. The third lesson, Jesus will be with you in the fire. We read in Matthew 10, 29 of Abednego, are not two sparrows sold for a cent. Jesus says, yeah, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. The very heads of your head are all numbered, so don't fear. You're more valuable than sparrows. Jesus says, I love you. If he could speak to us right now, what would he say? I went to the cross for you. I went through the fire, the pain of the cross to save you from your sin because I want to be with you forever. I want you to be in my house forever. And don't you think if that's true when you go through the fires of this life, he's going to be with you. You felt his presence in those times, haven't you? When you lose a loved one. When my dad passed away, that was a, that was a hurtful thing, folks. But I'll tell you what, Jesus felt more real to me in that moment than ever before. It's right there. And the hope that he offers for eternity is such a comfort. When you go through the fire, Jesus will be right there. And he'll bring you out the other side. Here's the, the last lesson for us. Make sure we get this. It is in the fire that we get refined. The big question is not, what is the enemy going to do to me in this fire? The big question is, what is God going to use this fire to do in me? How is God going to use this fire for my good? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, we read these words about our God in Malachi 3.3. 3. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. You and I are like silver being worked by a silversmith. And God is working on us. Silver is placed in a, a crucible. It's, it's heated in the flames till it melts. And the impurities rise to the top. The pure silver goes to the bottom. And then the silversmith will skip, skip off, uh, skim off the top of the impurities to get that pure silver underneath. And he carefully regulates the temperature of the fire so that the silver itself isn't damaged. It's heated just enough to get rid of those impurities. When you go through the fires of this life, that's what God's doing. He's purifying you. I believe Peter may have been thinking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when he wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think that their faith and their relationship with God was stronger before or after the fire? After. Your relationship with Jesus. Are you going to be closer to Him and more like Him before you go through the fire or after? what he's doing. That's what he's doing. Faith that is tested. Faith that is proven is more precious than gold even though refined by fire. Our faith is refined when we go through the fires of trials. So go through with Jesus. How can you take a stand for God this week? How can you take a stand in your life when the temptations come your way, when people are trying to get you to compromise? What can you do to take a stand for the Lord? You've got to ask yourself that. And ask the Lord to help you see where you've already compromised, where you've already bowed down, where you need to stand up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it has it been good to be here, Lord. It has been good to, to worship you in song. It's been good to worship you in our giving. It's been wonderful to worship you through communion, to remember what you did for us on the cross. And all of that reminds us as we've looked at your word, that your
sure with us in the midst of the fire. Lord, there's nothing the enemy can throw our way. There's nothing this world can throw our way. Politicians can throw our way. There's nothing our bosses at work, our, our, our girlfriends or boyfriends or, or neighbors or family, there's nothing anybody can throw our way that's too great for you. You've called us to stand for you. And Lord, you've promised to be with us through the fire that we may face. So we pray that you help us to stand. Help us to stand for you. Keep our eyes on you in the midst of the fire. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand right now and sing a hymn of decision. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, right now is the time to do it. Don't wait for next week's invitation. The invitation is given right now. The Lord wants you to be a part of His family, be saved, to have your sins washed away. If you've not done that, take care of it today. Won't you come as we sing?